Sports has always been a common theme uh, because it requires people to work in teams to be able to take feedback, to be able to win and lose, and to compete, which is what we do in sales. Today, uh, kind of the first time this has come up before is living abroad. And I think this, I've seen in my personal life, not with me, but with other people, that when people spend time in another country where they're kind of thrown into it, especially young, uh, where it's good when it's young because you're adventurous, because you're open-minded, because you're willing to take a lot of discomfort. But what it does for you is, is it forces you into outside of your comfort zone for long periods of time. And as we get older, we kind of stick to our comfort zone. But sales, most of the time, it's right outside the comfort zone. And that's where that flow state is. It's usually just a tiny bit outside of your comfort zone, but not in the overwhelm zone. And if we're able to manage that and not have it manage us can be a key distinction. Before we get into the interview, make sure you're checking out our friends over at CoVideo. Uh, check it out. Video email is one of those ways of staying in touch with somebody that engages them and you lets you show who you are as a person, not just a bunch of text. So give it a shot. They've got a lot of free videos on how to do video, especially if you're uh, doing a lot of webinars or demos or video conferencing. To do it right, uh, it takes a little, a little bit of lighting, a little bit of a microphone uh, skills, a little bit of smiling and eye contact with the camera, uh, things that aren't intuitive. So give it a shot, covideo.com. Also, what's your schedule look like? Take a look at it. How many net new meetings do you have? We had some great office hours this week talking over different approaches and how to use all the different modalities that we have in sales, social, email, phone, uh, web webinars, and whatever you got, yet we have to use it based off of what our client is willing to engage in. So start the conversation, get the meeting is all about that. To understand how strangers want to be approached and how to do it in a systematic, scalable way to fill up that calendar instead of coming in every Monday and looking at a blank slate and a list of people that you have to call that don't want to talk to you. Have people that do want to talk to you. And I show you how. Go to b2brevenue.com. Let's get into the interview. I'll sum it up at the end and give everybody an update on the office hours and the one-on-ones. Hey, Paul, welcome to the show. Is way of getting started. Tell us about yourself. Hey, Brian, thanks for having me on, man. Um, I am a Los Angeles based sales rep. Uh, and when I'm not working to sell data storage systems, <laughs> spend, <laughs> I spend a lot of time with my wife and our two young daughters. And when I'm not working or doing family stuff, um, I love solving puzzles, reading books, going for runs and exercising down at the beach. Um, just getting a lot of fresh air wherever I can find it. Well, you live in the right place, don't you? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> How'd you get into sales? Oh, my um, my path with sales has has been a an interesting one and definitely a fun one. I I came out of college um, having majored in in Spanish and minored in business, and not just to be honest with you, not really knowing what I wanted to do. But I always knew that I had a love for communication and kind of understanding what pe what makes people tick. Um, that was a big reason I majored in Spanish. I wanted to be able to travel. I wanted to be able to go study abroad and, and meet people and really like have um, a deeper understanding of, of what they were after and, and how to be um, in touch and present with them. Uh, that led to a lot of travel. Um, and when I when I got back, I got a job at a construction parts company where they had me doing all types of stuff. I was driving a forklift in the warehouse. I was going to job sites to deliver um, our products, which was a patented paver pedestal system, if you have any concept of what that is. Um, and then also sales and marketing back at the home office. And out of all those things, there were pros and cons to each, but what really turned me on the most was when a contractor would call in and we would get into, what does your project look like? 
what needs to happen to get the project across the line? How do you win the project? And then how in turn does my company win the project to sell our pedestal pavers to you? So I discovered that was kind of like the, the main thing that I like doing there. Uh, that led me to a job where I um, did cold calling, door-to-door -door walking sales of UPS shipping contracts for about a year. Um, I learned a lot about how to take no and how to take rejection. And I, I still love sales, but I just thought for the amount of effort that I'm putting in here, there's got to be yeah, a smarter way, a di you know, a different effort to reward ratio that I can recognize. And that's when a buddy of mine um, introduced me to his team at a uh, data storage company where I used to live up in Seattle. Um, and basically, as soon as I walked in for my first interview, I said, this looks like it. This looks like a place I could I could really be successful and uh, make some great relationships and ultimately like establish more of a career than than what I've been doing up to that time. Yeah. And what was it like transitioning from selling shipping services and construction stuff to selling like IT stuff? Well, it, it was a lot of learning, right? I didn't know about a NAS, about a SAN, about Ethernet, about fiber. I didn't know any of that. So yeah. it was a lot of studying up front. But I found that the the skills I developed on the construction part side, on the shipping contract side, they all carried over. I knew how to talk to people. I knew how to um, understand what they were going through. And that was the part that I enjoyed the most. So um, basically, once I kind of got my feet under me with, with some knowledge about our product and the competitive landscape in which we played, uh, I was able to translate to some success really early on. I, I definitely missed being out and like going to talk to you know the owner of the company and try and sell him a shipping contract versus you know sitting in a desk all day making 50 100 120 phone calls and uh and talking to it managers and you know a, a different um a different sort of audience um but i was able like i said to uh, to book some meetings uh, even on my first day of smiling and dialing and uh i haven't really looked back since then and where's this curiosity come from? I mean, it sounds like that's the type of person you are, where you're, you're curious about others, how the world works, mm -hmm. seeing things through other people's eyes. Oh, good question. I, I think some of it is I've always liked to be put in a new situation where you got to adapt rapidly. You got to think on your feet. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe a little bit of BS is involved. But you're MacGyver. definitely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, MacGyver. That's a that's a PC way to put it. Um, but you know, you gotta you gotta land and and start sw or start swimming right away. Um, when when I was young, my family moved across the country from the East Coast out to Seattle, and I was you know in middle school and find right. like finding a new group of friends yeah. right off the bat. And I I thought that as challenging as it was in the first couple of weeks, it it kind of taught me a lot about how to go and like interact with people and figure out, are we matching right now? Or is this something that's not going to make sense for like a friendship or, you know, homework buddies or, or whatever it was that I was looking for back then. And, you know, cause a lot of people do either that or they hide in their shell. Yeah. You know, and yeah. was there a particular catalyst for that? Or is that the way you are? I think that I think that that's just kind of the way I am. I um, I grew up also playing sports and okay. hiding in your shell in sports is not really an option, right? You right. got to go out and, and <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're just going to sit on the bench if that's if that's yeah. the case. Um, so no, I really enjoyed uh, pushing myself, and I didn't. I wasn't going to be satisfied with just knowing like the one other, um, you know, the one other kid who was going to sit in his shell as well. Right. And did you play team sports or individual sports? Yeah, mostly team sports. Uh, yeah. Lacrosse was lacrosse was my oh, big yeah. one, and I learned a lot in in lacrosse. Um, I was fortunate enough to play all through college, and you really get to you really get a sense of like how you fit into the world in that microcosm of the team. Um, I, you know, speaking of like adapting. Um, about halfway through high school, my coach asked me to switch from an offensive attackman position to playing goalie. I don't really have any experience, but I thought, well, I get to play the entire game. Yeah. If, I'm, if I'm a good goalie, I'll play the entire game. And if I'm a good leader as a goalie, I'll be able to put my defenders in front of me 
in places where I would rarely see a shot that I couldn't save. Yeah. So I thought it, it gave me a lot of uh, openings to kind of explore leadership, even in high school and college. And um, on top of that, I, you know, looking back on it now as a sales guy, you can kind of like put anything into the right lens. Um, but looking back on it now, it also taught me a lot about resetting quickly, right? L lacrosse is a high scoring game. And as a goalie, you're not expecting to shut the other team out. So you can never get too, too high after you make a save and you can never get too low after you get scored on. Cause you're going to have to turn around and look in the ball, look in the goal and break that ball out. It's, <laughs> and it's if people reality. are counting on you, you know, cause it's very much the center of attention at that, that point, that moment in the game. Oh yeah, for sure. There's, I mean, maybe less than a second of the ball being in the air flying right at you and you got to figure out how you're going to respond. Yeah. And why did you decide to leave, you know, a big, probably a secure company, you know, to, to go to a smaller company? Yeah. Um, I mean, to be, to be totally honest with you, there were two main reasons. I was, I was covering some of the largest um, enterprise accounts that, that we sold to at my prior company. And I was, I was kind of in, in a tension between what my company was willing to offer in terms of, uh, you know, R and D and, uh, delivering new feature sets to the customers that, that I sold to, yeah. um, and my customers who were pushing me to get that done on their behalf. Um, I was, as you can imagine, the, uh, the responsibility and kind of like the, um, the target on your back grows, but sometimes you're not, you don't get the feeling that you're given the tools to, um, to address that properly. And so that was a big one. And then the, the other thing that I wanted was the opportunity to build something new. And so when I joined uh, my current company, which, uh, yeah, it's, it's a smaller, you know, we're a smaller shop, we're, we're a growing team. Um, I think we had something along the lines of like 30 to 40 customers. Wow. And over the past few years, you know, we've tripled, quadrupled that count. And um, I was the first sales guy hired there. So I, I've really gotten to enjoy the process of, um, of building a business. And, and it's something that I wanted to like develop that capability in my career, because whether you're at a big company or at a small company, if you get hired to do a sales job or a revenue attracting job, you're on the hook to build something. And did you know somebody already there? Yeah, I I'd worked previously with a couple of guys who um, who had gone over to my current company, and uh, you know, all credit to those guys because because they're incredible. <laughs> but when I got there, I was like, I'm not sure this is exactly what we talked about, guys. <laughs> looking was, through your uh, notes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was. Um, I think at that time there was about I think I was number thirteen on the wow. team, lucky thirteen, and. Um, you know, as the first sales guy hired, there, there's a lot of, um, of creation that has to yes. be done, creating relationships, creating sales collateral, creating process, um, presentations so. yeah. and yeah, the process for sure. And, um, I'm super proud of what we've built. It's been an awesome ride and, uh, the, we've done a lot of cool stuff just this year that I think is going to impact our, our trajectory in the, in the right direction. And how about as far as, you know, you just, you're the first sales rep in there expectations are probably pretty high, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, you're, what do they say, pioneer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, had, somebody had to go uh, plant the flag, you know what I mean? <laughs> somebody um, gets all the arrows. Yeah, I, you know, I was lucky. I came into a place where we had a couple um, partner right. relationships that were forming, that were developing. Yeah. Um, and so I was able to w figure out ways to align myself with the partners and work that direction. Um, and then because of the, um, like I said, because of the 30 to 40 customers we had at the time, there was a little bit of track record, right? Those, those deals had been sold by the CEO and the CTO going and calling on a lot of their friends on a lot of their previous, yeah, um, network you know, contacts and yeah, network. Um, but those folks were willing to help us with references. And as every sales person knows, the, the reference goes a long, long way in terms of developing a conversation. And what's it like now? Because it's almost five years. Yeah, coming up on the five-year anniversary, it's, it's crazy how time flies. And uh, 
like I said, it, it's amazing. You know, we've been through a couple of product iterations, each one better than the last. Um, we've been in uh, very competitive cycles and, and won deals that you, you know, you never would expect to win going into it, frankly. We're going against um, 50, $100 billion companies and yep. <laughs> little old <laughs> us winning the deal. Are you kidding me? Um, so we've seen a lot of we've seen a lot of great successes. We've seen a lot of progress in terms of what we're able to deliver to support our customers, and and that's the most um, that's probably the most rewarding thing is just seeing the success of of the customers where where you feel you know what we do is we support media and entertainment workflows, right? Okay. So anything from uh, an ad that you see on a video ad that you see playing on your phone to uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars feature film from a ma from a major studio, um, and while we're not directly helping to create that content, there's really smart and creative people who are doing the editing, doing the visual effects, writing the storylines. There's actors you know delivering their lines, and um, there's all these amazing people ahead of us in the process, but we are some little part in that chain. And it feels really incredible to be associated with some of those projects. Well, that's it, because I was thinking, you know, because I've never really seen that many salespeople located in LA, which is kind of weird because, I mean, from a population standpoint, I think it's what the number two largest city in mm -hmm. the country. You'd be surprised how many salespeople there are down here. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not a uh, it's not a suffering population by no. any stretch, and, and especially in technology, right? Our our um, our product here in yeah. LA, a lot of which is media and entertainment, but we also have finance, we also have biotech, we also have um, law, insurance, all different types of uh, organizations, automobile factories for sure. We got Tesla, Toyota, Hyundai, all these places. Yeah, um, yeah. There's no shortage of sales guys and, and opportunities to find. And, and how do you win these deals when you're competing against uh, Goliath? Yeah, so I think a lot of it um, comes down to first spending your time in the right place, and yeah, and focus. second finding yeah focus for sure, and then finding a good fit, not only between me and the prospect, but between my company and their company. Okay. How do I how do I create an environment where um, I understand, you know, there's a couple of things, there's a couple of layers to it, right? But I got to understand what makes your company successful. And then I got to understand how my product can benefit that success. How, how is our um, success going to be tied together? And how can I view my own success through your lens? And are you selling to IT? Or are you selling to the user? Yeah, so we, we kind of think of ourselves as addressing, uh, you know, the triangle between um, the IT administrator, yeah. the creative end user, and then of course, like the financial or the, the business decision maker. Um, I would say the, the most important person in that triangle is the creative because that's everybody's yeah. customer. Yeah. The, the IT and the business buyer are in service of that creative person, and then we are at their service. So if we can find our way into like the the VP of post-production, something like that, that's an amazing place for us to start. But on the other hand, the CTO knows about the problems that the creatives have because they're banging on his door all day long. And so if we have a conversation or we're able to develop a relationship with a CTO or a VP of IT, that's also a, a really positive sort of lane to play in. And then you have to justify it to the finance people. Is that Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. You you always have the you always have the fact that at some point somebody's going to ask, "Well, why does this cost what More. it costs?" Yeah, yeah you well, we already have spend. something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've had something for the past 3 to 5 years. Why not go 7 to 10? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um So yeah, we we do have the we do have to sort of say, "Look, in terms of return, we're going to point to uh, what we call a return on performance. Okay. And performance can be measured in a lot of ways. So we have flexibility there. We can say, you know, just ones and zeros, kind of speeds and feeds, we're going to make you guys way faster. But what if uh, performance also meant you were more efficient in getting your creative work delivered on time and on budget? That's a huge win for any studio, for any sort of content creation shop. Um, we are also extremely price competitive. Um, but we basically what we try and do is create instead of an ROI an ROP and we, we can measure performance in, you know, 
a dozen different ways. And focusing on the way that they view it, right? Yeah, for sure. Which, yeah. which, of, which of these um, performance metrics is most relevant to you? To you. Yeah. And it's all about determining, you know, you know, you want to find a lot of uh, alignment. You want to find a match between you and your prospect, whoever you're meeting with. And if, if you ask good questions and you truly listen to the answers, they'll tell you which of those metrics matters to them. And what has made you so successful at sales? What, you, what distinctions do you see between what you've done and people who haven't been successful or not as successful? Um, I, I love to compete first and foremost. I think that, you know, um, there's a, there's a big part of me that like w once I'm in the, you know, once I'm in the game, like I'm not letting go and I'm going to figure out a way to score my points and, and to win. That's a huge thing that I love to do. Uh, like I said, figuring out other people and what makes them tick is also a huge driver for me. And then, um, uh, finally I would say listening. I, I think it's so critical to just zip it and let your customer talk. If you think you're going to hear what return on performance metrics or any, you know, what, if you think you're going to hear what matters to your customer while you're talking, you're wrong. It's just not going to come while you're talking. So mm -hmm. I think the best way, you know, and this is, this is simple stuff, but you know, you ask those open ended questions, um, you offer a little information and then you expect to receive some in, in, and let that guide you for the next phase of the conversation. I mean, because you've gone from two very deep areas. I mean, data storage, super deep, mm -hmm. you know, very acronym oriented. <laughs> yeah. Right. All the three letter terms you could guess. Yeah. Speeds and feeds. And then mm -hmm. into media, which is more artistic, but yet still super deep. Mm hmm. You know, mm -hmm. because everybody cares about certain things and the technology is moving insanely fast. Yeah, it's, it's been such a fun ride for those reasons. Like, you know, 10 years ago, starting at my first day at a big time data storage company, um, it was overwhelming all the, all this, all the material that I knew I was going to have to study. Not only, not only the stuff that I was going to have to learn about the industry and the competition, but um, the, the presentations, like what was I going to have to know how to say in front of a customer? What, what was, what kind of live fire questions was I going to receive and be on the hook to answer? Um, and then to, yeah, like you said, kind of go from that pool into the deeper and more specific pool or niche of media and entertainment technology. Um, it's, it's been such a fun learning experience. And um, I, I'm really, I feel fortunate that the lessons I'm learning here in this sort of corner of the universe uh, would be applicable anywhere. It, it is because people take, you know, kind of one end of the spectrum is there, they get scared and they're apologizing for not knowing stuff. Mm -hmm. to the other end where you're curious and interested in their perspective of it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you're never going to know as much as about it as they do. So, so oh, you, yeah. can't, you can't even try. Yeah. It, you, I, I think it never hurts to ask a question and, you know, to say, honestly, I don't, I don't know that, or I've never heard that. I don't understand that. Can yeah. you fill me in? Yeah. And what other things have you developed? I mean, because clearly they pulled you, in with you know a, a reasonable amount of sales experience but not like a vp level you know mm -hmm. like a 10 15 years not yet <laughs> <laughs> so they must have had some confidence or saw something in you yeah i had had uh, i'd had a couple really successful years at my previous company and um I, I felt like it was the time to, to make a move that would really set my career on a different trajectory and that, that starting at a smaller place where I could really put, put my stamp on the, the progress that we made was going to be great. Um, you know, working at a big company, um, it's really different. You have a ton of support and you have yeah. a ton, you know, as a salesperson, you're running a, a little tiny business with inside of a big, big business. Um, and so, for example, if you had, a, a down quarter, if you had a bad month, there was going to be one of a hundred other sales people there who had, you know, who outweighed your bad month, right? Who kind of like fill, picked up the slack. 
Um, and when, when you work for a small company, every win, every loss just really means a lot more. The blood, sweat, and tears that go into every engagement and, and the preparation that we do because of how much each you know, conversation matters to us, uh, it's high stakes, man. It's, it's really fun for that reason. And, you know, tying it back to playing goalie and lacrosse, like I can't imagine um, uh, kind of taking my foot off the gas when, when there's so much to go after and when there's so much pressure and when, you know, the, the activities that I'm pursuing on a day-to-day, -day, on a week-to-week -week basis are, you know, keeping the company running and supporting the team around me. Now, because that goal, the goalie mindset versus like the, I don't know what they call them in uh, lacrosse, but like the forwards. Yeah. Like an attackman. Okay. Because the attackman, clearly the desire to win. Mm -hmm. Goalie seems more like the, the fear, not fear, but the preservation of not losing. Yeah, sure. I, I don't know, to be honest with you, I've heard, I've heard you ask other, other folks this question on the show, uh, but I'd be torn. I, I think I would just say like 51% hate <laughs> losing, 49% love winning, you know, yeah. maybe even like 50.5 and 49.5. I, um, I'm that guy who would, you know, if you beat me in ping pong, I demand another game a thousand times until I got, until I got a win. <laughs> <laughs> and, and is it because you feel like you're leaving, letting the team down or is it personal? Oh, it's not, it's not personal. I just, um, I just want to, I just want to get the victory. You know, the, the feeling of, you know, knowing that you accomplished it is, is what it all boils down to. And I think people in sales have to have that caring mm -hmm. instead of that shrugging it off and moving on. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you're not emotionally connected to it, mm -hmm. you're not going to go the extra mile. Yeah, for sure. And I think that, I think that resonates with people, honestly. I, I think that one of the, the tools that, that I've developed over the past few years working for a smaller company is the ability to translate our culture and our values to a prospect, um, you know, in a sales call, which sounds kind of strange, I think. But I think if we can find that we have a match or an alignment in terms of my values and my company's values and your values and your company's values, we're really, you know, making a lot of progress in that conversation. And, and that's part of building a team because a, mm -hmm. a team is aligned on values. Yeah, for sure. Not and if you're doing it, if you're doing it really, really well, you know, I've got my team, the, you know, the systems engineers that I work with and the developers who are actually like putting their, their efforts into making our products better. We've got a team at my company, but if I'm doing my best work, the customer is on my team as well, right? He, he's thinking, I see, what, I see what Paul can bring to the table. I see what Paul's solutions can bring to the table. And I'm going to look good if this all goes the way that we both know it can. And the, the teamwork thing must have really came in handy at the startup. Because... Oh, you have to, yeah. You have <laughs> because to... you could be the lone wolf kind of at a, a big company. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But as well, yeah, I mean, I mean, nobody, look, everybody's, everybody's here, right? You, you've got the team that you're going to battle with. It's not like you can go hire somebody to make some new PowerPoint presentations for you or, you know, so like day one, guess who's cold calling? It's me, right? We didn't have <laughs> your SDR. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so you got to be ready to wear a lot of hats because nobody's like, nobody's coming to your rescue, right? You're, you're in the lifeboat and however many guys and gals are in it with you, that's, that's the team. So figure out who can do what and how can you, um, you know, divide responsibilities so that everybody's doing um, the most towards the successful um, outcomes that you want. And what do you like most about sales now that you've kind of, you've been in it quite a while, it's your career? Yeah, I, I'd say still meeting new people. Um, yeah. I, I love going into a, uh, a conversation and just not knowing exactly what I'm going to get. You know, you can look somebody up on LinkedIn. You can read the latest press releases from their company. You can kind of get a, a some, maybe even look them up on social media um, if you have time. Uh, and all that research, I would say, really helps in advance. But um, at some point, you got to walk in and, you know, shake somebody's hand and, and make a good impression. And... Uh, that, that's a fun moment. You know, you're, you're the new kid in class at that point. And, and that was something that I enjoyed growing up and that still uh, 
kind of makes me makes me hum uh, today. Yeah, because this is kind of the first time I've talked to somebody where they the desire to live abroad. You know, but it it now comes back to that curiosity and interest in others. Yeah, I I think it's really eye opening to understand more perspectives than just your own, and whether that's you know driving across the town, driving across town for. Um, a coffee with a customer going to a different city or even across the, the whole planet to go, you know, yeah. sell a system on a new continent. Um, all those things really um, add facets to who you are. And I, I think the more understanding, uh, this is a, apart from all sales stuff, the more understanding that, that one person can uh, have for other lifestyles, the, um, the more interesting and interested you'll be. Because it also gives you kind of insight into what you think they'll do and what they care about. Mm -hmm. And those, those elements that you brought into the ROI or the return on what process or performance performance because yeah. mm -hmm. you're seeing yeah. the world through their eyes. Yeah, for sure. You, you can take in all these different perspectives and say in the past when I've had a customer who kind of said things like this or who kind of responded to me in that way um, you've got a little bit of a frame of reference and, um, it, it, I think it's so important to not just have like kind of a, a single path, um, in terms of what you're able to do or who you're able to talk with. Yeah. Cool. Right. Hey, it's been a fun conversation. Where can people go to connect with you? Yeah. So I've got a, uh, I've got a LinkedIn page just like everybody. You can find me at, uh, linkedin.com slash P Swanson 85. And then, um, I'm also active on Instagram. Uh, you can see I'm wearing a tie-dye shirt today. I, I've, uh, for about the past year, done a series called Tie-Dye Fridays, where every Friday I wear a tie-dye shirt and I post a picture of myself wearing it. And uh, <laughs> it's been a fun, it's been a really fun way to engage. So on Instagram, my handle is Gator Boots Gucci Suits. <laughs> but with, yeah, obviously, Cla a classic rap song lyric for those who know. Um, <laughs> But it's uh, spelled with no vowels, so it's G T R B T S G C C S T S. Have you been outside your comfort zone? Every day we got to do it just a little bit, and it's just that first minute that is painful. It's a lot like diving into the swimming pool. Uh, you could inch your way in and wipe your hands and legs down with that cold water, and acclimate yourself to it, or you could just dive in. Uh, the, the science actually shows that the diving in is the less painful, but it doesn't look that way now, does it? And, and sales is a lot like that too. And that's one of the reasons we get commissioned is because it's the uncomfortable part about business. I, I always remember, you know, being at startups and you bring the CEO out or some leader and they'd have this academic view of how a sales call should go and how the customer should react with it objections and how we should handle them and how they should view the market. But what they kind of learned was what we know is that they're mammals, they're people, they have reactions, their view of your product may not be as glamorous and pristine as uh, the venture capitalist view of it. And what I used to call home office was the bunker, meaning that it was the comfort zone. It was the echo chamber where people would always talk about the product and academic standpoints. Uh, but we out in sales were the pioneers. We're out there fighting the war, the reality. We're the people on the ground. If you've ever watched the old World War II movies where they have the war room and they have a table set up to show the battlefield or the, the world and move ships around and tanks around to represent what's going on on the field. That's We're out in the field. We are the people, even if you're in your little home in your bunker, as soon as you call a customer or talk to a prospect, you get the reality. They're not thinking about us. They're thinking about them. They're in their battleground. And we're trying to enter it. We're trying to get out of our comfort zone to go talk to them. This is not easy, and this is why sales is the way it is. And I hear academics talk about, oh, we should compensate on customer success and everything. Well, that's nice, 
It is. It may work. But <laughs> to get people to do the hard stuff, to, to handle confrontation, to engage with somebody who doesn't necessarily at first want to be engaged with, that takes somebody getting out of their comfort zone. And if you don't give them a reason to, they won't do it. <laughs> Uh, how's the pipeline looking? Can I ask you that? It looks pretty good right now, right? We still have quite a bit of time ahead, as we think. But take a look at the calendar and then start marking out those holidays. Marking out those days off. Marking out the things that aren't really full days. Get rid of those weekends. People aren't working on the weekends, at least not customers. We are, though. And all of a sudden the time... Ah, it doesn't look so good, does it? You want to finish the year strong? Winning the complex sale. How many deals do you have to win to pay for the course? Uh, less than one. And what will you learn in there? Uh, the largest library of real content based on the complex sale taught by pretty much the only person out there who teaches it, who's done it for 25, 30 years who came up with a system because he wasn't a natural salesperson and never worked at a company where it was taking orders. I always did startups. Yeah, one got bought by IBM, yeah. And that was a different little uh, tour of duty, but all the rest were tiny little first sales guy hires. Uh, pretty much what you hear on the podcast quite a bit, out of the comfort zone all the time, having to learn how to get companies to take action keep a deal moving, how to prevent it from getting stuck. Oh, we lost to no decision. How much does no decision pay? Zero. How much does starting over pay? Negative, because you have to start all over. The other thing that might happen is they'll buy as little as possible. Well, great. I spent three months to get a tiny little transactional deal. I show you how to prevent all of those things, how to give the company what they need, how to Sherpa that deal through the tundra of end of quarter. Uh, your manager doesn't know this, okay? They probably haven't done it in a long time. And when they did, they probably did it at a company in a great economy with lots of demand. But we don't have that. <laughs> so we have to become clever and prevent it from getting stuck. Everyone calls me, hey, it's stuck. What do I do now? Hey, how, let's, let's prevent it from getting stuck. I show you how. I show you how companies buy. And this is a system that I developed a long time ago and it's been honed over my career because I was the type of person, I didn't want to lose deals. Not because of ego, it was laziness. It was like, I put a lot of energy into this and if I don't get paid, uh, I'm not happy. So I want to work on deals that can and will close. I want to usher them through the process. And if you can't afford the course, don't take it. But can you afford not to take it is the real question. How many deals will slip into next year? Because if it goes into next year, you don't get paid on it. Oh yeah, you'll get something. But it, what they do is they just add it to your quota. So your commission rate essentially wipes it out. Meaning that it goes from 5 to 3% or whatever. I know how they think because they think it's just going to happen and they're going to give it to you in quota at what you forecasted it at, not what it comes in at. So if you forecasted it for 500 K and it comes in at 250, you've got the quota for 500. This is how those rascals think. So be smart. Get all of those deals in now. Enjoy your holidays. Enjoy your next year. And don't get quota for the stuff that you're not going to get paid for. We're in sales. And sales is about closing deals. So winning the complex sales solves that. They all come with office hours, which is an hour meetup every other Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern, on Zoom. Uh, it's Q&A, case study based. We just had a great one yesterday. I love doing them because people are passionate. And what's really exciting is when people close the biggest deal in the company's history. And we've had several of them. The one-on-ones, which you get unlimited number of them, 
are 30 minute coaching calls with me applying the course to a particular deal. You can chronicle them in the one-on-one -on -one section, the very last section of the course. Hear how a deal goes from stuck to closed in six weeks. Biggest deal in the rep's history. First year, rookie rep, closed that deal. Guess how? Yeah, we worked it through. Wasn't with discounts, it wasn't with trickery, it was guiding the customer through the process. No one teaches this because nobody knows. I know, I, I see all the other stuff out there. You know, the person who worked at one company and got fired, or worked at another company and got fired, or worked at some company in the tornado. Yeah, okay, one hit wonders do not make great sales reps. Make uh, nice little stories and they can start their own little business, uh, you know, singing the platitudes. Because in sales, uh, you can go into a conference room and everyone sounds good. It's when the rubber meets the road. It's when you're dropped into the enemy territory and you have to survive. That's what really differentiates sales. And getting the deal is not academic. It is warfare. It is treachery. They, every company has all of these guards, all of these roadblocks to prevent them from spending their money. It's not natural. They don't get up in the morning and say, let's spend some money. No, they go, how can we make money? And the easiest way to make money is to not spend it. So they have all kinds of ways, legal, procurement, uh, management, you spend the company's money and it doesn't work out, you get fired. There's all of this that we have to work our way around. That, talk about outside the comfort zone. Brian, you're scaring me. No, winning the complex sales the answer. Sign up. It, it's really for one, you know, the key rep that gets it is the one that can take feedback, wants to learn, and isn't cheap. So if you're cheap, and you're a know-it-all, it's not for you. <laughs> Don't do it. But if you want to close deals and you're open-minded and you want to put a little work and a little money, it's perfect for you. We'll see you next time. Oh, are you checking out the other podcasts? Are you telling a friend about the show? Sales questions, brutally honest answers. B2B Revenue Leadership. Two other great shows. One's daily and one's twice a week leadership show. Check them out on your favorite podcast player. Make sure you're checking out the YouTube channel as well. Just search Sales, Brian Burns, and you get to see it. If you see my stuff fly by on LinkedIn, give it a little like, a little comment, a little share. I would be so grateful for that. Thank you.